guys, welcome back to another video. So, with 2023 coming to a close, I am going to rank all 10 of the comic book movies that I've seen this year. Um, now, I didn't uh, get to see uh, Boy Beetle, and I haven't seen Aquaman, uh, Lost Kingdom yet. But I was like, I might as well do this now, because I don't necessarily want to do it, because... At the beginning of next year, I'm going to do my best of 2023. My, uh, I don't think there was anything bad uh, in 2023, so I won't necessarily do my worst, but I'll do um, my most anticipated for next year, and I'll do that sort of stuff. So I think um, there's a lot of stuff coming in. In the few months coming, I'm going to do reviews of the Ghostbusters movies and rankings of them, and also... Godzilla and Kong stuff, so a lot of stuff to look forward to in the next few months coming up. So, number 10 for me is actually Spider-Man Lotus. So, I think that this was actually a pretty decent movie, but the only problem with this one is that this was the only film that I didn't make it to the end of. I was actually getting kind of sick of it. Now, I do think that there are some interesting things in this movie, like the whole... It did some cool stuff that I liked seeing that we did never actually seen in a Spider-Man movie. Um, like, the whole rivalry between Harry, Peter, MJ, and Gwen, and them hanging out, and that sort of stuff, and how much Peter loved Gwen. I think that they did in a way that the Tasm movies didn't do it, and I thought that that was interesting, because, like, the Peter and Gwen dynamic was uh, in the Tasman movies are very kind of similar to the Peter and MJ relationship in the Raimi movies, except for the whole stuff with MJ being a terrible person and, like, uh, breaking up with Peter and going on to Harry Osborn and dating Flash and that sort of stuff. But I think that there was some interesting stuff in this movie that was very interesting in the whole thing of Peter being jerks to his friends without having the symbiote because he's upset that he's lost Gwen and there was some <clears throat> interesting stuff of Peter seeing this little kid as Spider-Man and basically giving this kid a hero to look up to and basically telling him look I'm not the hero that you think I am and then he needs to think about what he said in front of this kid that looks up to him and it's like sorry that I said what I said I, I'm sorry. I think that there was a lot of cool, interesting stuff there. And I think that there was some... I think the thing is, too, is that it also looked... Even though that's a fan film and it's not, like, um, something that came to theatres, I think that there is something about the film that definitely looks fan filmy. Even though the CGI looks amazing, I think that the actual stuff that, they, that they've shot on location that wasn't... The kids, the superhero stuff looked kind of looked kind of strange, but I think that the actual drama stuff, MJ dealing with the trauma of Peter and Harry and the stuff with Gwen, was really interesting. And the whole scene of um, Flash and MJ on the rooftop was really really good and very 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 well done. And I really liked that about Spider-Man Lois. And I think that did things to the Spider-Man character that. I, as a fan, appreciate seeing um, in a fan, in a film uh, because it dealt with stuff that we haven't really seen in a Spider-Man film at all. Even though that my favourite is No Way Home, it does No Way Home does stuff out, doesn't do things like the comics, um, and does it in an interesting way, which stuff like um, the Tasm movies and the Raimi movies, and Lotus use elements right out of the comics. Like, high, full stop. Now, number nine for me, this is where I get to the, what you call, um, this is a step above Spider-Man and Lotus. Like, lots more. But then I think the other ones are like step above that, right? So number nine for me is Ant-Man the Wasp Quantumania. And I really like this film. I think that they're, 
this film gets overhated. That when you, I think it's one of those movies that's like the more you rewatch it, the less fun it is. Like it's fun for the first. I'll say more than 20 minutes, up until the point where, I want to say around the part that they're trying to uh, look look for Scott, I think up until the part where Hope, Janet and Hank are trying to look for Scott and Cassie, that's where it starts to get boring and you get the whole slow progression of that movie, but I think that the whole thing of um, Scott and Cassie's relationship is very, very good and seeing Catherine Union take on Cassie, that was one of the casting decisions I was like, oh god, what are they going to do in this movie? I'm so concerned. But they actually turned out very, very well in this movie. I think that worked, right? So I think that there were a lot of things in that movie that made that movie work and better than some of the other MCU movies like Doctor Strange or even the first Avengers, right? Um... I think that there are a lot of things in this movie that made made the movie work, and having Kang in there was a really, really good villain. Unfortunately, we might not be able to see that again, so we don't necessarily know. So, the fact that we know now that the whole thing with Jonathan Majors is an issue moving forward, and we don't know if they're changing to a new villain or keeping Kang and just going to a different actor, I think that there's something about those movies about that movie in particular that almost feels wasted now because it's like they have a they had a plan for it and they set up and now they're probably we're probably never going to see Kang again after uh he who remains in Loki and Victor Timely in Loki season two and also Kang I think that there are a lot of things in Quantumania that are never going to come to fruition in the future because the way that the Jonathan Majors uh, thing has played out, right? So, now I think that number eight is, I think when you get to number eight to six, that's where you get to a step above um, a lot of the a lot of that stuff. Because um, I think that the rewatchable ones to me would kind of be from eight to one for sure. Um... I think Lotus and Quantumania are the two ones that are like, they're good movies for different reasons, but they're not brilliant in any way. But 8 for me is Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Now, you would think that this movie would be high on the list, but if you guys watch my review of Into the Spider-Verse, when I was leaning, uh, when I was doing the reviews till No Way Home, and also, you watch my review for Across the Spider-Verse when it came out. I liked it better than the first one, but here's the thing. And I might do a separate video on this. I felt that Into the Spider-Verse was one of those films that was good, but I felt like that that's one of those movies that you could have done as a cinematic universe, right? Because... Sony wants to do their own cinematic universe. Like, they're doing it with Venom and stuff like that, which I'm... I like the Van movies, but I feel like that your true uh, Spider-Man uh, cinematic universe is in the Spider-Verse, right? So kind of like what they're doing with the games where you have Spider-Man, then you have Miles Morales Spider-Man, then you have Spider-Man 2, and then you have um, probably another game coming out, and then you have all these different games, and then you get to a Spider-Verse. I feel like that is the way that you should have done Into the Spider-Verse, where you had a Spider-Gwen movie, you had a Peter B. Parker movie, you had a Penny Parker movie, you had a Spider-Ham movie, Spider-Man Noir movie, you had... And then you have Spider-Verse the way it was. Like, I'm saying don't change really anything about it, and have the Miles story interwoven with the Spider-Verse story. I think that there was a lot, of, but I think that this one was a step up, definitely, from Into the Spider-Verse, and if you uh, see my rankings, it definitely was a step up to me. This one was more rewatchable to me than the first one, even though that spot is kind of a kind of, like, not the greatest villain in the world, but it's still kind of like, okay, they're getting one of the more ex obscure villains because they want to really flesh him out over two parts, and 
by the end, he's gaining more power, so he's going to have a lot more to do in beyond the Spider-Verse. Um, and I think that the Miles and uh, Gwen relationship is great. I think that Gwen is an absolute standout in this movie. I think that the whole thing of um, the different cameos is what we kind of, what I kind of originally wanted out of No Way Home. But the thing is with this one, I'll like, I'll have the same feelings about this one where I like it, but I don't think it's the greatest spy movie, spy movie, of, spy movie, movie of all time, much like Into the Spider-Verse. And I felt like that No Way Home, the more I watch it, even though that's my favorite movie, favorite movie of all time, I feel like the more I watch it, the more, more, and more I appreciate that movie. And I think that that's what makes um, these Spider-Verse movies good, but not great. Is that it's like, they're very good and entertaining movies, but they're not uh, one of those movies that it's like, I'll watch them over, which I think if I watch them again, I'll like them more, but I don't think I would... Uh, say that this is the definitive Spider-Man movie, right? But I do think that there were a lot of good Easter eggs. I I did a lot of oh my god moments when I saw Andrew Garfield, Tobey Maguire, and um, the and Spectacular because I grew up on those, right? So there were a lot of Spider-Man Easter eggs, and I was going, "That's this Spider-Man, that's this Spider-Man," um, and stuff like that. So I loved that, right? And I think that there was a lot of cool things. In Across the Spider-Verse, that made me go like, that's a real good movie. But I don't think it, but it doesn't crack my top five. Definitely not of comic book movies of this year or comic book movies in general, right? It would be like somewhere in the low to middle range for comic book movies in general, right? So that's why I have Spider-Verse at number eight. Now, number seven for me, I don't think it's a great movie, but number seven for me is Transformers Rise of the Beast. I don't think it's a good movie, but as a Transformers movie, as what they want to do with the Transformers, it's really good. Now, even though that I still think that the designs, the Rise of the Beast designs have more Bayism to them than the Bumblebee designs, I think that they're a lot of the, I think that it was so cool that they changed to the G1 designs as opposed to like the Bay ones where it was like all the met all the metal inserts and like with some red popping out um, and some blue. Um, I think that there were some cool things about the Bayverse, but Rise of the Beast nailed the cartoon. I think that the only weakest thing for me in this movie were the human characters. Not that they were bad, but I think that there were way better, way better human characters with like Sam Witwicky and Michaela and. Uh, the Warburg character, right? I think that there was, and especially Haley Steinfeld's character, um, Charlie, I think that she's tied for me with, uh, I think it's her, Sam Wicking and McCall for the best characters of the Transformers movies franchise, right? So, I think, I think Rise of the Beast kind of gets, a lot. I hate that, I don't really get why, because I think that Rise of the Beast definitely is the Transformers movie that we've been wanting. That and Bumblebee. Especially when you get to the end of this, and I can I can say it now because, um, I mean, people already know this, but at the end where it's like the dude hands um, the kid the card and it's like, we want you for, for this army, and he flips the card over and it's like, G.I. Joe. That's like everything you want. It's like, that sets up the future of the Hasbro universe, like with G.I. Joe, with Power Rangers, Transformers, and stuff like that, right? So I think that there are a lot of things in Transformers Rise of the Beast that nail it and make me go like, yes, this movie is so much fun. So number six for me is The Marvels. I think that this movie gets a lot of flack. I don't think that it's the best MCU movie, but... I think that there's a lot of enjoyable aspects to it, right? So I think that the thing that's... The reason why this is higher than a lot of other stuff that you might say are better than it, like Across the Spider-Verse and um, even Rise of the Beast, right? I think that the Marvels has the dynamic between all the girls. 
I think those are great. I think Miss Mar uh, Miss Marvel Kamala Khan in Mumbalani still the show. I think that how they tied, uh, how they made their little like Avengers kind of saga out of Captain Marvel, WandaVision, and Miss Marvel, and had that little build up to that. I think that it really, really works the way that they built it up over a, what I would like to call the Marvel saga, where you have Captain Marvel and that lays the groundwork for um, the future of like Monica and stuff like that. And then you have one division with all the Monica and has the scroll pointing up there, basically saying Nick Fury wants you in space. And then you have, uh, Miss Marvel, that you understand that she loves Captain Marvel um, and how that all works. I think that is great, and I love how works inside that little, little small uh, quadrilogy saga that they built within the Marvel's brand, right? And I really like how they, how they've done that. I do think the villain is the weakest part, but I do think that there's more. Redeeming qualities than just going like, oh, a terrible villain and women. Um, so I think that they're, because the internet at the moment just hate on stuff just to hate on stuff when it comes to the MCU and calling it MCU when I don't think that's true. When you had alone Ant Man and Guardians 3 this year, how can you call it MCU? Um, that's just ridiculous. So getting into my top five, my top five. This could easily be switched around uh, a lot, right? So I think that there's a lot of things that can be switched around. Um, but I do think that my top five are ones I'm going to be constantly watching over and over again because I just love these films and I love these brands, right? So number five for me is Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Once and Always. Now, I think that Once and Always was a great way of selling the 30th anniversary of Power Rangers and celebrating the end of the Power Rangers franchise, right? I haven't seen uh, Dino Fury yet. I mean, um, Cosmic Fury. But I haven't seen a lot of the later series that came out past... Hell. Past Megaforce, right? I haven't seen a lot of the seasons. I've seen some of Beast Morphers. I've seen quits from Dino Charge, but I haven't really seen... I've seen some of them just still, but I haven't seen anything uh, that is like, I love Seasons Times of Mega Force, right? So, but I think that Once and Always is the way to do a reunion special uh, with their characters and not just like what they do for Harry the Harry Potter reunion or something like that, where they just sit down and talk about their experiences. I think that this is a way to handle a legacy of a of the death of an actress that works very, very well, while also making doing a tribute to someone that died months before, um, even though that his character's still in there, they didn't really write him a character uh, like a, oh my god, Tommy's died, because they were making this around the time that JDF died. But I think that the way that they did the whole clip at the end, where they play basically a clip from the old show and did the tribute to Trini, uh, to, um, oh my god, I forgot her name, but the actress who played Trini and JDF was great. And I think that the way that they handled that was beautiful. And I think that the way that they did the, way that they did the CG Zords was very, very cool. I think that um, it's a step up from what they did in the original series where it was just dudes in suits. Because even though they like the guys in suits and it suits what they were going for with the original show, when you have something like Netflix or you're doing a movie version, I am expecting an update. And this is the perfect way to update a series that is 30 years old. And I think that that is such a great way to do it. And I love that. I I love how they did Even though that I wish it was done, because I will do a video, I am going to do a video at some point of like, 
what if my mom from Power Rangers once and always was better, but wasn't, but it's not, nothing to knock uh, once and always, because I think it's great. But I think that it would have been great to get JDF, Amy, and um, Austin back as Jason, Tommy, and Kimberly back in this. Even if it's like they do what they did with them, but you just have extra scenes of them in it. Um, I think that there would be a lot of cool stuff if you did that. But given the circumstances and the way that they had to do it, I think that they did a great job with it. And I don't think there could have been a better way to do it without without having the others in it, if you know what I mean. So, number four for me is Shazam! Fury of the Gods. Now, coming off the first Shazam, I, I loved it, right? It's my favourite DCEU movie. Favourite DC movie in general, right? Other than uh, Batman Returns. But, given that... Most of the most of my favorite movies of all time are filled up with um, Marvel movies with random movies that are not superhero based. The only two that crack, I want to say, around my top thirty, top twenty of favorite movies of all time is Batman Returns and Shazam One. Other than that. The other two five stars are further down on my list, like Superman 2 and Birds of Prey, right? Which I still love, but I think that those two are really the quintessential of my DC movies, right? But Shazam 2, I loved it the first time, and I thought it was good the second time, but I think it got a little slow the second time. But I would prefer re-watching this over and over again, because I love the word Shazam, and I love Zachary Levi as Shazam, and I think that... Uh, the world of Shazam is my favourite world, well, not world, but um, favourite section of the DCEU when you're talking about franchise, right? Uh, we, because it's like, it's two movies and my favourite my favorite section would be the Batman section with, Affleck, with Batfleck, but we haven't really got a solo movie. So, like, the Batman section is stuff that I really, really like but it's nothing really like, um, nothing like up there of like, this is the, this is the quintessential of Batman, because it's all Batman vs Superman, Awesome Edition, or Theatrical, you have Theatrical Suicide Squad, you have Theatrical Justice League, you have Zack Snyder's Justice League, you have The Flash, and that sort of stuff, right? So you don't have a lot of Affleck standalone stuff in there. So my favourite standalone section is the Shazam section of the DCEU, and I think that Fury of the Gods makes that whole thing work very, very well, and even though that might, it might be a step down from the DCEU, it's not like a huge step down. The first film is a 5 out of 5 film for me, and then this one is a 4 out of 5. So it's a step down, but it's not like it ruins your experience of the two movies. But I really like Shazam Fury of the Gods. I think it gets way more flack than people give it. People give it. Um, and then number three for me is my favorite DC EU movie of the year, and that is of course The Flash. Now The Flash, I really, really loved. I think that it's one of the best movies I saw this year. Seeing Ezra Miller do The Flash was really, really good. I loved him in. Both cuts of Justice League, I I don't really have much to say about him in uh, BBS because BBS and Suicide Squad, he didn't really have a lot to do. Um, but I think The Flash is great. I think that Sasha Cowell was a really, really good Supergirl and probably the second best Supergirl that we've seen on screen in general, right behind Melissa Benoist. But I think that she was a great Supergirl because when... Because if you guys remember, when I saw the trailers, I was like, I don't think I can get by the Supergirl. Because if you want to do the ultimate Flashpoint movie, you would have to do, like, um, Melissa Benoist, Supergirl, Michael Keaton's Batman. And that's the trio, right? With the two uh, Barry Allens. But I think that Sasha Cal it was a great Supergirl. And I think that seeing Michael Keaton's Batman one last time was awesome. 
my favorite Batman of all time. You guys already know. I've already said in this video uh, about in Shazam: Fury of the Gods um, that Batman Returns is one of my favorite movies of all time. And I love 89. It's my second favorite live-action Batman. So his Batman is the my favorite Batman of all time. And I really, really love that about it. And I think that there are stuff in that movie that makes it unbelievable. And some stuff that is kind of like... Eh, but it's nothing that takes you out of the movie. Saying goodbye to Batflick was very, very heartwarming. Um... Even if it's not a lot of him, and you just get the whole bit of him doing the doing the bike chase at the beginning and talking to Barry in the hall, in the alleyway was very very sweet, and I love how they captured that. Right, I think that that was very very cool to see, and I loved how they did that. Um, and of course, the cameo the cameo from Wonder Woman in both Flash and Shazam got me. I love seeing Gal, even though that. Um, she was in Flash, even though that she wasn't in Shazam, like, the actress wasn't there, and they just kind of, de um, not DH, but, um, CGI'd her face in Shazam. Both of those movies made me go, oh my god, Wonder Woman's here. Um, but yeah, I loved The Flash. I think The Flash is one of the best comic book movies ever made. Not the best, but I think that there's a lot that I would put on top of it, but, this would be on the bottom side of my four and a halfs. Because if you guys saw my review, it's four, out, four and a half out of five stars. Which is on the lower end of that when it comes to comic book movies. But I loved that movie. I think it was so good. Now number two for me is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Moon and Mayhem. Now, if you guys saw my trailer reactions, I... Not that I didn't hate the trailers, but they, it was very much like... This is giving me kind of Spider-Verse vibes. I don't want a Ninja Turtles movie to be influenced by Spider-Verse. Because Spider-Verse, even though I like the Spider-Verse movies, I don't love them as much as everyone else. And it's very much like, I don't want this to be the animation style that we get out of Turtles movies or uh, Pixar movies or DreamWorks movies or stuff like that, right? Because I was afraid that it's like, if they touch Turtles with that specific art style, we're not going to get away from this art style. But I was wrong. This movie is absolutely incredible. And I love how they did. I love how they teased Shredder. And I'm excited to see how they're going to go with it. And lean them off going to school. And even though that I wasn't in love with the portrayal of April. Not because of the race or anything like that. I liked the... Um, like, I liked the way that they portrayed April. But I more thought of April as like a news reporter, that sort of stuff, and I didn't like how the 2012 series, and especially the Rise series, influenced this April, because she reminds me very similar to those Aprils, then to the Channel 6, or, or working under Baxter Stockman, news reporter, or scientist, April, um, but her character arc was really, really good, and the battles were really good, and... The villains, like Superfly, was surprisingly a shocking villain. Not having Baxter Stockman turn into that fly was such a missed opportunity, in my opinion. But it would have been a cool thing to do. I liked how they changed the uh, changed the background of the turtles, but also keeping it true to what we know of the turtles. Um, and, and I think that Seth Rogen's company did such an amazing job of turtles that it's one of the best films I've seen this year. So, of course, coming in at number one is, of course, Games of the Galaxy Volume 3. And I think that this movie is the quintessential of comic book movies in general, right? So, like, of Marvel movies, whatever. Like, especially this year. Marvel movies this year have been good, but they haven't been as best as they can be. This is the best that they could get this year because it's like, it's James Scott, James Gunn's goodbye to Marvel in general, right? Not just Gunn's something else, but Marvel in general to take over the DC. And I think that he did a great job. Sending off all the characters was amazing and not 
surprisingly, not killing any of them was su so surprising to me. I was surprised that they didn't kill anyone. Even though that's like, oh, okay, you've, you, you've done that. It's like, no, there's no better way to do it. And I love how they gave them the, uh, more the comic accurate kind of costumes in this movie. I love how it picked up right after, pretty much up straight after the guys of the Ghostly Holiday special. Even though that I think that the villain is kind of the, not the weakest part, but not the best part of this movie. I think that the movie in general was very, very good. The action scenes were really good and very entertaining. The humor landed, like the whole bloody uh, door scene. It's like, all right, what do we do now? Open the fucking door. That was great. I think that the all of the um like all of the cast did an amazing job in this movie and I love the Guns of the Galaxy movies. The only one that is kind of not bad but weakest to me is the first one. But from everything else forward I think that they are great. And I think that they're this is my favourite Guns of the Galaxy movie. Um and this is honestly in my top five of MCU movies. It was that good. Um, but I really, really loved it. So, guys, that is my ranking of the 10 comic book movies I saw this year. So, guys, please hit the like button down below if you haven't already. Hit the subscribe button, the little bell icon to get enough for future videos. Now, mate, I'll see you guys next time. Take care. Bye. Hey there. Subscribe to my channel. And also press this bell icon.